Welcome back to another video this is a part 8 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 29, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 29, Asuma Hayasaka. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Sona and Issei's guest room. We can see the couple, both sitting on the mat floor with a futon over their legs. On either side of them, a few books could be seen. Meanwhile, both teens were quietly looking through the books that were in their hands. Sona's book was titled, Yukaya of Ancient Japan, Volume 6. As she continued to skim through the pages while nodding to herself, Issei was reading, the story of Kuzunoha, the fox's wedding. Issei then rubs the back of his head while looking confused. You know, maybe we should ask your sister. I mean, aren't the two of them friends or something? Sona pinches the bridge of her nose in frustration. Baka, Seraphal is clearly in on all of this. Besides, I doubt she would even know. The moment I asked her, why Yasaka of Kyoto chose you to be her hus. Dot hus. Husband, no, absolutely not. Still rubbing his head, Issei thinks for a moment and comes up with an idea. What if I just asked Yasaka? I mean, maybe it has something to do with, I dunno, dragons or something. Wait, let's ask the drag. Sona tilts her head and then looks down at Issei's arm. Adjusting her glasses, Sona speaks her mind. The drag has been pretty quiet as of late, hasn't he? Issei thinks for a moment then he smiles. Nah, he's just lazy, right, partner? There was no reply, which prompted Issei to start shaking his arm into the air. Oi, the drag, wake up. Sona begins to speculate. Perhaps Yasaka's spell did something. Issei rolls his eyes. Look, I know that you're upset with her right now, but you can't just blame her for everything. I am sure it's nothing. Think about it, I did an overbooster recently, so the drag is probably just, I dunno, sleeping. It's fine. Sona puffs her cheeks out. I am not simply blaming her for everything, Issei. Placing his hand now on Sona's head, Issei slowly gives the C3 heiress headpats. Don't worry. No matter what, I really care about you, so don't be too upset. Issei then smiles brightly. Looking back at her boyfriend with glossy violet eyes, Sona simply takes a deep breath. Whatever. Then, the slightest half-smile could be seen which was quickly corrected back into her stoic frown. Alright, tell you what, how about we? Issei was cut off by the sounds of knocking. Issei-kun, are you decent? I'm coming in. Seraphal slid the rice paper door open and walked into the room. Seeing both Sona and Issei under the futon made the Mao want to join them, however, she was here for Yusaka this time. Sona blankly stares toward her sister. Rude much. What do you want? Seraphal. The sea tree heiress now rolls her eyes. Seraphal proceeds to walk toward the couple while showing a slight smile. She then crouches down and looks deeply into Sona's eyes. You and I are gonna have a talk, sister. Seraphal then turns her attention to Issei. And you are going to meet with Yasaka-san. Seraphal then turns her attention at the open door. Kuno, come and collect Issei for your mother, please. Instantly, the little fox princess came running in. She was wearing her usual red and white kimono and she had a flustered blush to her face. Once she came to Issei's side of the mat, she reached for his arm and began to pull. Let's go, Papa Kun, mom isn't the most patient of women. Sona's face contorts to a grimace. What did you just call Issei? Kuno sticks out her tongue toward Sona and continues to tug at Issei's arm. Let's go, hurry, before the scary lady has a chance to act. Sona grinds her teeth. Well then, you can forget about the deal we had earlier. Kuno raises her other hand and shows off her pinky. No, no take backs. I did one favor for you and, because of that, payment is due. Before Sona could react, Seraphal tackles her sister into a hug. Ah, don't be so stingy. If you made a deal with a fox, you must hold your end of the bargain. Besides, your Issei will be just fine, Yusaka-chan just wants to talk, that's all. Deciding that this was the time, Issei stood to his feet and began to walk out of the room as Kuno led the way. Turning his head to get one eye back on Sona, as she was being relentlessly hugged by Seraphal, Issei smiled. Remember what I told you earlier today, alright? 
Sona stops struggling for a moment while looking back toward Issei. She then apprehensively nods while puffing her cheeks out. Scene, Yasaka's chambers. My lady, Hyodo Issei has been brought to your doors by the princess. A female guard, wearing a ceramic fox mask, was bowing toward Yasaka. Nodding, Yasaka makes her way toward a large shrine of some sort. She then shows a sad smile. Please, show him in. Also, make sure Kuno goes to bed. Yes, as you say, Lady Yasaka. The masked guard leaves the room. Shortly after, Yasaka begins to light multiple incense sticks while placing them beside a picture frame. Interestingly enough, from a distance, this photo looked as though he could have been Issei's older brother. Long hair with very piercing eyes, the man in the photograph had a very solemn smile. Yasaka proceeded to pull a pair of large prayer beads from her kimono. She then begins a mantra as a small tear falls to the floor. Yasaka quickly wipes her face the moment she hears Issei enter the room. Turning from the shrine, her golden eyes stare toward the bewildered team. Again, scratching the back of his head, Issei smiles nervously. Good evening, Yasaka-sama, Erm Yasaka, hee hee. Showing her trademark crescent-shaped smile, Yasaka makes a slight bow while pointing toward a mat which was placed in front of the shrine. Good evening, Issei. Please, sit down. We must talk. Nodding, Issei felt a bit reluctant as Yasaka's voice sounded different. Unlike her usual kind and polite voice, this time, there was true emotion behind it. It was the sound of a girl, speaking to you, right after she finished crying. Now sitting down, Issei showed a look of worry. Are you alright, Yasaka? Did something happen? The teen tilts his head. Yasaka shakes her head. Yes, something indeed happened. And no, at the moment, I am not alright. I won't be until you hear the story of Asuma Hayasaka. Will you listen? Issei nods as he looks past the fox queen and toward the shrine. The incense took over the room as the odor was that of sage and frankincense. Noticing a picture, Issei assumed this was who Yusaka was speaking of. Yusaka slowly makes her way toward the mat and sits across from Issei. It is the story of my daughter's father. It is the story of a tragic man, tortured by his own inner demons. Only to find such a demon to help soothe his soul for a time. Yasaka then lays one of her tails, gently into Issei's hand. Still looking directly into the fox queen's eyes, Issei begins to close his fingers and grasp lightly on her fox tail. At first, Issei felt incredible heat coming from this soft appendage, only to feel his eyelids become extremely heavy. Then, darkness, seen, feudal Japan, the Meiji era. We see the man from the photograph. He is wearing a white and sky blue yukata. On his sash are a pair of katana swords, one of which is longer than the second. He has a deep scowl as he stares down a group of individuals, all dressed in different styles of samurai armor. Then the man known as Hayasaka spoke in a deep and direct tone. Shinyu Kakugo to Ronin, he then pulls both of his katanas out from their sheaths. The longer dado blade was in his right hand as the shoto blade was in his left. Meanwhile, the other six samurai also pull out their swords. The leader of the group pulls his mask over his helmet and speaks. Shinsenkumi ni Heru Kododa, Anata wa Jibun Jishin to Anata no Kazoku no Meiyo o Kizutsuk Mashida. Sanatame ni, Watashitachi wa Anata ni Shio Taikyo Shimasu. After words were exchanged, a bloody battle ensued. One by one, each of the armored samurai were slaughtered as the one known as Hayasaka seemed to dance with both of his blades in the evening snow. Once the last man was killed, the samurai in blue and white simply swung both of his blades into the air which caused a cross-shaped blood imprint on the white snow below his feet. Instantly, the man falls to his knees while staring at the carnage that was left behind. He had memories of the past, flooding into his broken soul, as if it were boiling hot water. Memories of his wife and two daughters. How they died while he was on a campaign, fighting for some lord at some point, he couldn't remember anymore. But he did know that it wasn't by the means of another person, no, this was disease. Not even able to see the bodies of his family, Hayasaka arrived from his battle, far after the funeral rites were observed. Because of this, because he had nothing, he wandered. Left in a world where the ways of the ancient samurai were coming to a close only to make way for more westernization. Oh how he hoped that his suffering could be relieved by dispatching the enemies of the state, but he was thoroughly and utterly mistaken. 
It was true, in battle, he felt nothing and at least nothing was better than suffering. But, just like a band-aid, battle was only a temporary bit of relief. Once the fighting was done, the memories would come back, like carrions coming to poke at exposed flesh. It hurt, so very much. Deciding that he has had enough, deciding that losing count of all the people he has killed in the past and up until now, deciding that he just wanted to see his wife again, his girls, he knew what must be done. Standing from his position, he aimlessly began to wander deeper into the forests of Kyoto. His dado katana dragged against the grassy ground as he slowly lingered forward, covered in his enemy's blood. With thoughts of intense sadness, he continued to waddle past the trees and bushes until he found a small stream of water. Choosing this to be the place for his beautiful death, Hayasaka proceeded to wash both of his swords with the spring water from this stream. Now sitting down on a patch of grass, the man undid his yukata and lowered the robe from his shoulder, exposing his bare chest and abdomen. Placing his larger sheathed katana leaned against his shoulder, he then unsheathed his smaller blade while looking closely at it. He watched as the moonlight danced against the Japanese steel while he prayed silently. Then out loud, Hayasaka declared, Eijiru Suma, Eijiru Masumi Tachi, Ryoto Hirogat Watashi o Kanje Shite Kudasai. Preparing to plunge this blade into his own stomach, the broken samurai made one final scream before. Instantly, something had held his hand. Looking up, the weary warrior began to shake uncontrollably. To the samurai, he was looking directly at what he perceived to be a god. Attempting to free his hand, Hayasaka found it impossible as his entire body was now unable to move. Shouting at the creature that was preventing him from leaving this terrible world, the samurai declares. Kitsune Akuma, Anata ni Taikyo Suru Mano wa Nani Moneno, Watashi o Barabarani Shite Oit Kudasai. Watashi Kara Te o Hanashite Kudasai. Yasaka was standing over the samurai. Wearing her usual golden kimono, the fox queen had one of her hands clamped tightly around the man's wrist. Eventually the shoto fell from his hand as the samurai lost almost all strength within his own body. Showing a sad frown, Yusaka then crouches down and looks over this Shinsengumi. Now looking directly into his eyes as the man scowls back at her, Yusaka shows a warm smile. Anata no Tamashi o Iyashimasu. Watashi to kite, Anata o Niwa ni ti sert ikimasho. Anata ga yasand iru ma, Watashi ga hana ni iro o nuru no o might kudasai. Watashi wa Anata o Kizutsukmasen, ninjin. Otetsudai saw set kudasai. After hearing these words permeating with his own soul, the samurai fell into a peaceful sleep. Meanwhile, Yasaka laid the weary soldier onto her lap while she combed through his long hair with her fingers. Era era, shish. Seen Yasaka's chambers, Issei opens his watery eyes. Coming back to reality, the teen was staring directly into Yasaka's golden and equally watery eyes. What was that? Wait, that guy, he is Kuno's father. How is that possible? I don't pretend to be a historian, but I am pretty sure the Shinsengumi were way back in the Meiji era. Issei then felt something akin to Sona praising him for his historical accuracy. Yasaka nods. He lived for a very long time, Issei. Up until nine years ago actually. Issei thinks for a moment. Nine years. Wait, how old is the fox princess then? She looked to be about eight or nine years of age. So, you kept him alive I am guessing. Issei then showed a very serious frown as he continued to look toward Yasaka. Yasaka nods. Yes, I used my power to keep him from aging or dying. I did this to help heal his soul. I took him into my home. We spent a great deal of time together. In fact, for a time, he was very happy. I was very happy. However, he still had deep-seated regret and in the end, he begged for me to release him. Yasaka immediately breaks down. Issei jumps from his side and immediately pulls Yasaka's head into his arms and hugs her tightly. Shish, it's alright. I am sure he loved you very much. Yasaka nods in the teen's chest. Yes, he did love me, so much. In fact, he couldn't stand the idea of me being alone. He loved me so badly that he gifted me Kuno, right before he went to sleep forever. Oh yes, Issei, he loved me and I him. Yasaka's eyes burst with tears as Issei could feel them soaking into his shirt. Nodding, Issei was also crying. It's okay, it's okay. Damn, it's alright. 
The teen had no idea what to do or say in this situation, but one thing did make more sense now. When Kuno called him, Papa Kun, just recently, Issei's eyes widened in understanding. Yasaka then spoke as she pried herself from the boy's chest. Issei, I am sorry for putting you on the proverbial spot without explaining beforehand, but I felt that I needed to act. Issei scoffs playfully while smiling. Don't apologize for a damn thing, Yasaka. I don't regret anything, Yasaka smiles while sniffling a bit. Well, to be honest, that makes me very happy to hear. Though, there is something I wanted to tell you since we are here, in the presence of my Asuma Hayasaka. Issei then looks back toward the shrine and nods slowly. You can tell me anything, Yasaka. Blushing at those words, Yasaka continues. Asuma is a distant relative, an ancestor of yours, Issei Hiodo. Don't you see, not only did he provide me with a child, he also found you. I truly believe he brought you here, to Kyoto, to find me. Issei looks deeply at the photograph. He couldn't argue, the guy looked like he could easily be his older brother. As strange as it sounded, Issei wasn't going to argue with a creature that can literally see through the very fabric of time and space. Thinking about how Sona is going to freak out, Issei cracks a small smile while taking hold of Yusaka's hands in his own. Looking back at Issei, Yusaka tilts her head confusingly. Well, let me at least tell you what I think. First off, yes, I do. Issei then winked which caused Yusaka to get a bit flustered. Second, Kuno deserves a good father. I can't promise that I am experienced in such things, but I can promise that I will spoil her as if she was my own. Yasaka's eyes widen as her blush continues to intensify. Issei didn't notice this as he was now looking off into the distance while thinking seriously. Though, I guess technically, she is blood related, so I guess in a way, she is my own. Before Issei could come to his own conclusions, Issei's mouth was invaded by Yasaka's tongue. Chapter 30, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 30, Foxes, Dragons and Devils. Scene, Yasaka's Chambers. Yasaka kept her golden eyes open as her arms slowly wrapped around Issei's shoulder as she continued to stare deeply into his eyes. Following Yasaka's lead, the surprised teen did the same and refused to close his own as the two continued a very long and intimate kiss. Aj, partner, what in the hell was that? Issei's arm began to glow a crimson and emerald color. Yasaka and Issei pulled back from their kiss as the couple's attention was now on Dedrake. Issei began to smirk, knowing that he would be able to mess with Sona, saying that he was right about his dragon, sleeping after his overbooster. Yasaka slowly placed one of her index fingers to her lips as she began to blush once again. Issei then cleared his throat. Yo, dude, what's up? Where have you been? I honestly don't know. Seems like I am only able to recall feeling very sleepy, it started sometime last night. I've only now just come to. Issei's arm was continuing to pulse with red and green light. Yasaka then giggles a bit which gains Issei and presumably Dedrag's attention. Era era, I might be the one to explain all of that, Heavenly Dragon Kun. Greeting Yasaka of Kyoto, please, with all due respect, explain. Yasaka softly whips one of her tails across Issei's face causing him to blush. Era era, you are such a polite dragon coon. Well, since you've heard of me, I assume you are aware of what I can do. Finding this actually very interesting, as Sona and Issei were studying different lore and folk tales regarding Kitsune, the team thought it best to listen and pay attention. Yes, very well. I used a form of senjutsu along with spiritual flows that reside within my temple to aid in my beloved suffering. In a way, I ate the specter that haunts Issei Hiodo's soul. However, by delving as deep as I did, there was the possibility that Issei's sacred gear would go through a temporarily dormant stage, in other words, you might sleep for a time. Yasaka then looked back toward Issei as she smiled and nodded. I apologize Madam Yasaka but I believe I misheard you. Did you just refer to my partner as, beloved? Issei's arm was glowing a bit brighter with flickers of emerald and crimson. Era era, I'm Issei's wife and he is my husband. Yasaka now places both of her hands over her cheeks as she blushes deeply. At first, Dedrag didn't respond. Issei was watching how cute Yasaka was acting and once she noticed him staring, she sent another tail, whipping lightly against Issei's cheek. Partner. I don't know if you somehow bewitched this Kitsune, 
or perhaps used blackmail, but this is a low blow, even for you. Issei's arm was now pulsing with red light. Issei was about to protest, that was until Yasaka placed her hand over the glowing arm. Calm yourself, please, I assure you, Issei-kun is not at fault, if anything, I am the guilty party. Alright, if you say so. Oh there is another thing. I have noticed a very large energy reserve increase. It's quite substantial actually, though I can't imagine you gaining this on your own, not without. Months and months of intense training. Era, era, guilty again, fufufufu. Yusaka now pulled Issei closer to her while she linked arms with the team. Her face adorned a strangely and very new mischievous smile. Dragon Kun, what if I told you that I didn't just marry the boy, but I also performed the fox's wedding, along with the red string of fate ceremony. Issei could slowly feel Yusaka wrapping one tail over each of his legs as they slowly worked their ways up his chest. You did what, has something like, that, ever been done before? It's one thing to bind a soul with another, but to involve someone of your power, along with. Yusaka interrupts as she giggles a bit, meanwhile her mischievous grin grows slowly. Along with the power of the heavenly red dragon emperor of domination. Yes, I am glad you understand the gravity of this situation. Issei is now completely wrapped from his legs, up to his chest, as Yusaka's fox tails slowly flutter and coil back and forth. Only Issei's forearm was sticking out from the blankets of tails. Glowing from Issei's arm once again, Dedrade responds. Partner, you are very fortunate. As before, you had almost zero magical capability, because of that, life force and sacrifices were needed to order to use my power to its fullest. This is no longer the case. Issei was about to say something, that was until he got bombarded with a barrage of kisses coming from his new wife. Kisu 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 kisu. Oh, um, I'm gonna go now. Scene, guest room, Yusaka Castle. About 30 minutes ago, Seraphal called for Sona's entire peerage to join them. After everyone was accounted for, the Mao suddenly got very serious. She spent a good deal of time explaining not only Issei's past but Yusaka's as well. She went into details regarding Issei's encounter with Rainier, specifically what she did to him and his fellow peerage member, Asia. Shortly after, she spoke of the teen's inner turmoil and his estranged relationship with Rias Grimori. As if that wasn't enough, she continued on regarding her, Sona and Yusaka's relationship and future intentions regarding Issei Hiodo. Once Seraphal finished with the story of Kuno's father, she then brought up the definite possibility of Issei being related to this dead man in the form of an ancestor. Even Sona started to find herself feeling bad for the lonely foxes, both mother and daughter. It was truly a sad story, enough for half of the peerage to cry, including Saji, as Momo and Ruruko took turns patting the sobbing teen on his head. Sona then cleared her throat. Not a word about this to anyone. Tsubaki then claps her hands once while showing a stern look, getting everyone's attention. You heard the president, right after, everyone in the peerage made their acknowledgements. Hi, Datorio, seen Yusaka's chambers, on a large, Floor-based in Japanese-style bed, we can see Yusaka laying on her side. She has a very warm smile as her golden eyes are hidden under her closed eyelids. Meanwhile, Issei has his back to her as she has the teen in a spooning position. As both of her arms were wrapped tightly around Issei, Yusaka rested her chin on the back of her new husband's head. The fox queen had her tails laying near her back aside from one of them. Following her leg, as she had it resting over Issei's abdomen, her tail was also outstretched over and under the team, pushing him closer into Yusaka. Issei also had both of his arms wrapped around the large and fluffy tail as it acted almost as a body pillow. As he had the warm and fluffy golden fur against the front of his face, the back of his head as well as his neck and shoulders were all very comfortably supported by Yusaka's chest. Smiling brightly, Issei also had his eyes shut while taking in every little bit. Of this moment, earlier, after Yusaka's story, after the tears, the couple showed their respect by bowing toward the shrine as the Yukai Queen closed the cabinet shortly after. She then asked Issei to do her a favor. The favor in question wasn't really a favor, if Issei really thought about it, rather, this fell more into the reward category, at least that's what he thought especially when it came to his past ordeals with Rias. It turned out that Yusaka wanted to cuddle with her new husband. 
Issei immediately nodded to the request which pleased the fox as she took him by the hand to her bed. Afterwards, Yasaka insisted on spooning, with a bit of fox fusion added to the mix. Hearing the slight breaths of the woman that was declared to now be his wife, Issei couldn't believe any of this. Firstly, there was his parents. Though, easily enough, Rias was able to mess with their heads using memory magic. Oh shit, how is Rias going to take this whole marriage thing? Issei then has flashbacks of the cruel things that his master had said to him. Instantly, thoughts of Sona's violet eyes, staring back at him, telling him that everything was going to be alright, no matter what, it somehow brought a sense of peace, well, rather it added to his already very peaceful situation. Another flashback of Seraphal this time, telling the team that he can count on Milky, that she would be there. Issei takes a deep breath and then lets it out slowly. Yasaka then opens a single eye and looks down toward Issei's brown hair. Era era, don't worry about Rias Gramori. Don't worry about anything, Sarah Tan and Sona Tan are correct, all will be well. You have very powerful women who love you, remember that. Issei slowly looks up as his eyes open in shock. Meeting Yusaka's single eye, Issei replies. How do you know what I'm feeling? This is so surreal, Yusaka. Opening her other eye, Yusaka then takes a deep breath of her own. She then released one of her arms from Issei while extending her pinky finger in front of the teen's face. We are connected, my love. Since I am a kitsune and a goddess in my own right, the red string of fate binds your body, mind and soul, to me. Unlike other creatures where the two are linked in an equal capacity, since I am what I am, that makes me the dominant force. Because of that, I can read your heart. I will always know when you are sad, happy, angry, confused, baffled, dot era era, aroused, foo 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 foo. Um, you're kidding, right? Issei had a look of sheer panic. Yasaka found shock rather cute. Placing a hand over his cheek and softly caressing said cheek, Yusaka replies while maintaining her very warm smile. You will find it that I am a no-nonsense type of woman. When I say something, I mean it. With that, I suppose we have a great deal of time to get to know each other better, era era. Don't worry about any of the details, leave it to your wife, darling. Now, I believe I have some prayers that need answering, which means your Sonatan is probably chewing at the bit, worrying about you. Issei rolled over while surprising Yasaka. Before she could respond, Issei proceeded to reach for her face with both of his hands while kissing her on the lips. Kisu, Yasaka's widened eyes began to close as she truly enjoyed the feeling of being loved by another. Scene, guest bedroom. Shortly after Seraphal's impromptu meeting, most of the peerage cleared out leaving Sona alone with Tsubaki. Both are currently sitting on the small loveseat near the rolled futon. It frustrates me, knowing that i am um jealous of that fox while at the same time i feel really bad for her it's truly conflicting subaki sona was cleaning her glasses with a cloth subaki looks to be staring off into nowhere while she shows a small blush well to be perfectly candid with you president we are devils my point is that many high class families in the underworld have polygamist views when it comes to marriage since isei Erm, Hyodo is a devil as well, it begs the question. Could a strong alliance between the Yukai faction and House Seatree become the result of all of you sharing Hyodo? Sona thinks for a moment as she places her clean glasses back over her violet eyes. Tsubaki, since when did you become a politician? Tsubaki snickers a bit before catching herself and going back to her usual stoicism. I will not divulge my secret, President. The vice president of the student council then showed a natural smile. But, more than ever, I just want you to be happy. Hyodo is a good person, your sister is correct. I've noticed a difference in your attitude since he has been in our, your, life. Tsubaki then blushes, smiling back at her queen. Sona was very happy to hear reaffirmations of Tsubaki's loyalty toward her. Thank you Tsubaki, you are amazing as always. Reaching over, Sona lightly hugs the flustered-looking Tsubaki. Looking over Sona's shoulder, Tsubaki continued to blush. Even Tsubaki herself didn't understand why talking about Issei started to make her feel strange now. The queen dismissed it as nothing more than a feeling of pity toward the broken team. Knock knock knock, Sona looked toward the rice paper door and could see the silhouette of Issei from the other side. 
Tsubaki noticed Sona's grip get tighter as she now turned to see who the knocker was. As if her blush couldn't get any brighter, the student council vice president pushed back from Sona and stood up. I'll leave you for the evening, president. Tsubaki bows and walks toward the door. Sona looked giddy which was a strange look for the usually self-disciplined Citri heiress. Tsubaki then slid the door open which started Issei. The two then look at each other for a single moment before Tsubaki walks past Issei without saying a word. Thinking that was a little weird, Issei shook it off while walking into the room and shutting the door behind him. Sona, I am so sorry. Please hear me out before you. Issei assumed that Sona Sitri was planning on some type of punishment the moment he returned from his evening date with his wife. However, Issei was cut off as soon as the Sitri heiress jumped from her loveseat and into the arms of the confused teen. Shut up, Baka. Sona then tightened her arms, which were wrapped around Issei's midsection. As her face was in Issei's chest, the Sitri heiress made her declaration. You belong to me, no matter what, okay. She then began to sob a bit. Instinctively, Issei grew a very warm and calm smile. Placing his hand on top of Sona's hair, the teen softly began patting. You found me first. You came when I had nobody. Don't you think for a single moment that I'd forget that. I, L, love, I love you, Sona Citri. Looking up while attempting to confirm what she had just heard, Sona found herself being kissed on her lips by an equally sobbing Issei. Kisu. Chapter 31. Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 31. Fatherhood 101. Scene Kuo Academy, early in the morning. Rias just finished with her morning bath as she was walking from the orc and toward the main school building. Yawn. Oh gosh, I did not sleep well last night, oh well, just a little longer and I can see Issei. As far as that stupid ghost is concerned, well, this time I will just ignore it. Yeah, that's a good idea, as long as I don't give it any attention, it should get bored and move on. Rias then flexed her right arm while pumping it into the air. Meanwhile, from the top window of the orc, Kiba was watching his master act strangely. She appeared to be talking to herself while carrying on with strange body language. Was she finally losing it? Kiba then took a sip from his cold brewed canned coffee drink. Deciding that Rias is probably acting out due to the overwhelming stress of the entire situation, including her punishment, Kiba chose to dismiss it for now and wait until their pawn returned from Kyoto. Kiba continued to watch as Rias met with Grafia at the entrance of the school. Taking another sip from his drink, the knight tilts his head. For a moment, he could swear he saw a reflection of something in the windows down near the school entrance, next to Rias. Adjusting his focus, whatever was there was now gone. Once again, the knight dismissed this as a hallucination on his part, possibly due to stress on his end. Shaking his head, the blonde teen took a deep breath and went back to his daily routine. Scene, Kyoto residence, Issei's bedroom. The blackout curtains blocked all of the morning sun from entering the dark room. At further glance, the room looked to be trashed. There were piles of clothes all over the floor with only two two paths that led to both the bathroom and exit. Aside from said paths, the bedroom was a disaster area. On the large mega master bed, Akino, Asia and Kaneko were all asleep. Kaneko and Asia both looked to be cuddling up to Akino, who was center in between the two. The rook of the group looked to have taken all of the blankets at some point during the middle of the night as she was wrapped in a pure Edo. Meanwhile, Asia was wrapped in some random clothes, presumably from the floor. Akino looked to be warm enough with both girls attached to her. Then a knocking sound came from the door. Girls, I've made breakfast. Get up and wash your faces before it gets cold. Issei's mother was now listening for any type of movement behind the door. Akino rolled over in a sleepy motion which woke Asia as her face was now stuck in her senpai's chest. We, were awake miss. Hiyodo. Akino then felt something wriggling under her. Looking down, she could see a small mass of blonde hair. Oh, Asia, how did you get in there? Era, era, seen, Yusaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan, Sona's guest room. Issei's eyes opened, delightfully thinking to himself, the teen found his new way of waking up very satisfying. The warmth, the smell of lavender, the feeling of safety, this was Sona's embrace. 
With his arms already wrapped around the sea tree heiress, Issei simply closed his eyes while he nestled comfortably into Sona's chest. Remembering what Yasaka told him the night prior, Issei couldn't argue the fact that he had very powerful women who loved him. Sona, Seraphal and now his wife, Yasaka, it was almost unbelievable. Now realizing that nature was calling, Issei's eyes opened once again. Remembering his methods for prying the cuddling heiress from his body, the team began to wriggle and carefully remove Sona's clamp-like legs from his stomach. Once again, Issei Hyodo was successful in his escape without waking his girlfriend. Once he had hold of his slippers, the team quickly made his way to the bathroom. After a bit of time, Issei found himself in the quiet hallways of the large castle. Taking a moment to listen carefully, the team wasn't too surprised to hear the television playing an episode of Milky Spiral. Thinking this was probably Kuno again, Issei smiled warmly and made his way down the corridor and toward the family den. Once through the entrance way, Issei spotted little Kuno. Once again, she was sitting on the floor, in front of the TV while eating a bowl of cereal. Issei was about to say something, that was until a random thought crossed his mind. Her father is that old samurai. Nine years ago, he died. The poor child never knew her own dad. Why is this bothering me so much? Issei continued to stare at the back of the little princess's blonde head. Now biting at his own fist, the teen noticed the feeling of wetness dripping from his chin. And here I was, all feeling sorry for my own punk ass, someone who has both a mother and a father, I have no right to complain about a damn thing. Kuno's fox ears begin to twitch. She then looks behind her. At first, she began to grow a bright smile, that was until she saw Issei's face. Seeing her reaction, Issei immediately covers his face while trying to stealthily get rid of his tears. Oh, good morning, Kuno, Issei wasn't able to see in front of him but he was surprised to feel something hugging his stomach. Moving his hands and looking down, Issei met with little Kuno's golden eyes staring back at him. She had a very concerned frown as her eyes were large with worry. What's wrong? Are you okay? You can tell me. Kuno tilts her head as her own eyes begin to water up. Issei then slowly crouched to Kuno's level while rubbing her hair lightly. Showing the happiest smile he could muster, Issei replies. I am okay. I promise. You don't need to worry. But, I just want you to know that you are a brave girl. So, erm, um, yeah. Kuno tilts her head the other way while showing a mildly suspicious look. Are you sure? You know, I can tell things about people, like my mommy can. So, don't try to fool me. Just because I'm small doesn't mean I am dumb. Issei continues to pat the fox princess on her head. I can't hide anything from you, now can I? Well, Fine, you caught me, I was a bit sad. Nodding victoriously, Kuno now proceeds to pat Issei on his head. Finally, you take me seriously. About time. Now, what is it, Papa Kun? What's making you sad? Hearing her call him by that name caused Issei to feel a strange tingle, but he went with it. Thinking quickly, Issei saw the half-empty bowl of cereal near the TV, then a thought came to mind. Well, to be honest, kiddo. It's sad that I've seen you eat that sugary cereal for the past two mornings in a row. But, you know what would make me really happy? Kuno shrugs, nodding. Issei looks toward the kitchen. Tell me, do you know where your mother keeps everything? I was maybe hoping that the two of us could make everyone a surprise breakfast, seeing as we are the first to wake up. Instantly the fox princess grows a very bright smile. Grabbing Issei's hand, the little fox pulls the team toward the kitchen. I want pancakes. I want bacon. Smiling nervously, Issei uses his free hand to rub the back of his head. Okay. Pancakes, check and bacon, check. Maybe some eggs and hash browns too. Let's make this an ultimate western style breakfast. Kuno throws her free hand into the air, pumping her fist. Yeah, breakfast with Papa. It took the two a bit of time to find all of the ingredients and supplies to prepare breakfast, however it went without a hitch. Eggs hash browns, pancakes, bacon, coffee and orange juice, all were almost finished. Issei was just finishing off the last batches of the pancakes as he performed their final flip with the spatula. Kuno began to set the dining room table with plates and silverware along with all of the condiments such as butter, jams and syrup. 
The father and daughter couple both had a pep to their step as Kuno playfully sang one of the opening credits to Milky Spiral. Unknown to the two, they were being watched. From the corner, a still rather sleepy Yusaka was rubbing her golden eyes as she observed the two. Seeing her daughter so happy as she was skipping around the dining table, placing napkins on each plate, this made Yusaka's heart melt even more than it already had. Turning her attention to a whistling Issei, who was adding to Kuno's singing, she watched as he placed the last of the cooked flapjacks onto a large plate. Yusaka then silently thanked her late beloved for this gift from the heavens. Mommy, good morning. Kuno noticed her mother and darted toward her direction. As Yusaka was hugging her daughter, she looked over toward Issei who gave her a loving wink. As Issei walked into the dining room with a few trays, he looked at both mother and daughter. Seeing Yusaka looking back at him, Issei smiled warmly. Good morning, Yusaka, I sure hope you slept well. Please sit down, Kuno and I have been working hard making breakfast. Right kiddo, turning from her mother, the fox princess gave Issei a thumbs up. Right, I had to show Papa Kun where we keep everything. He tried to trick me this morning too. He thought he could hide being sad from me. Well he won't underestimate me again, no way. Tilting her head, Yusaka looked back at Kuno. Sad, how do you mean, little one? Issei then cleared his throat. Ahem, well it was really nothing. I just saw the kiddo eating cereal again and thought she needed something more nutritious. I just told her it made me sad seeing her eat all that sugar first thing, you know. Kuno puffs her cheeks out. I like sweet things. Yusaka looks back at Issei as she forms an intense blush. Issei Kun. Issei now has a panicked smile. Sorry, did I overstep my boundaries? Yusaka then turns her gaze back at her daughter. Your, Papa Kun, is right. Sugar this early in the morning is not good for a growing girl such as yourself. Taking a deep breath of relief, Issei finished placing the food onto the table. Once that was finished, Issei thought he should go and wake Sona and the rest before everything got cold. Now walking past a fixated Yusaka, Issei found himself being stopped as the fox queen held his arm. Pulling the teen's face close to hers, Yusaka smiles on top of a very heavy blush. You are wonderful, I want you to know that, Issei. Before he can respond, Yusaka places a kiss on his right cheek. Kuno then sticks her tongue out and makes raspberry sounds. P-T-P-T-P-T-P-T-P-T-P-T-P-T-O-U-G-H. Gross. Cooties. Both Yusaka and Issei giggle at this. After Issei looks back at Yusaka, he blushes and then begins to walk toward and into the hallway while waving back at the two girls. Yusaka then turns her attention to Kuno. Well, little one. Did you both do all of this all on your own? It smells wonderful. Kuno nods matter-of-factly. Oh yes. Papa Kun did most of the cooking though. He didn't want me to burn myself or something like that. Yusaka crouches down at Kuno. Smiling warmly, the fox queen pats her daughter on the head. So, he is your, Papa Kun. I see, era era. Scene, guest bedroom. As Issei slowly opens the sliding door, he then tiptoes toward a bundled up Sona. She was still sleeping away peacefully. Crouching down next to her, Issei proceeds to take in the cute moment but then remembers about breakfast. He didn't want it to get cold. Pissed, Sona, it's time to get up. Issei was softly nudging Sona's shoulder. Then, eek, mmmpppphhh. Sona had instantly struck as a snake would. Somehow, she reached for Issei's neck with both of her extended arms while wrapping them tightly. Then, the teen was pulled into Sona's chest as her leg instinctively wrapped around Issei's midsection. Now stuck in between Sona's opai, Issei couldn't help but thank the god of perversion, whoever that might be. As he was taking in the scenic view, the teen's higher brain function kicked in. Shit, breakfast, gotta wake Sona. Struggling now, Issei made his way out from his muffled prison and was able to speak. Sona, the food is gonna get cold. Instantly, two purple eyes open and then look down. At first, Sona looked to be scowling but then she began to smell the air. Slowly, the sea tree heiress started to smile. Yawn, fine, but Issei felt intense pressure on his back and neck and once again, his face was right back in its rightful place. As the team struggled, Sona held on tighter and tighter as her smile turned into a grin. Did you and Yusaka do anything last night, 
You will tell me Hyodo. Talk. Sona looked to be enjoying herself as she interrogated the muffled team. Finally being given a small moment of breath, Issei, blushing and gobstopped, thinks for a moment. Holy shit, this is awesome. Hmm, maybe if I just... Yeah, breakfast can wait. Issei then shakes his head as if he wasn't going to talk. Seeing this, Sona then nods slowly. I'll loosen that tongue of yours, Hyodo. Once again, Issei was muffled. Unknown to Sona, both of Issei's hands had a thumbs up on each. Sona began to quietly laugh in a maniacal sort of fashion, that was until a knocking was heard on the door. Issei and Sona both looked toward the door. Issei then quickly whispers, nothing happened, but, if you wanna do that again, I am totally down. Sona then blushes as her cheeks begin to puff out. Baka, knock knock knock, gaining a tick mark, Sona proceeds to stand up while putting on a robe. Who is it? It's me, President. Your sister sent me to acquire both of you for breakfast. After hearing from her queen, Sona nods and replies. We will be down momentarily. Tsubaki replies through the doorway. Very well, President. And please, your interrogation of Hyodo was quite loud. Perhaps you might want to use something more appropriate, say, a dungeon. Sona flusters at this as Issei nods in complete agreement. The teen has a very lecherous look to his smile as he points toward the door, annoying Sona. Looking toward the door, Sona stomps her foot down. Tsubaki. The pitter-patter of feet could be heard leaving the doorway and off down into the hallway. Sona then massaged the bridge of her nose. Hiodo. Issei nods while getting a bit more serious. Before you get mad, just know that I made breakfast for you. You know, since, well. Thinking for a moment, Sona then sniffs the air once again. Pancakes. Issei nods. Yup. Sona tilts her head while tapping her foot on the ground. Fine, it better be good, Issei. Standing up from the futon, Issei proceeds to make his way toward Sona while placing a hand on her shoulder shortly after. Good morning to you too, Sona. Then Issei reached and kissed the sea tree heiress on her forehead. Sona went speechless. Chapter 32, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 32, Is it getting warm in here? Or is it just me? Scene, Yusaka Castle, Dining Room. Walking through the corridor was both Sona and Issei. The sea tree heiress had a mildly irritated look to her as Issei was smiling brightly. Sitting at the table was Yusaka who was next to Kuno. Meanwhile, Seraphal, Tsubaki and the rest of the peerage were all seated. Seraphal brightened her large and blue eyes while pointing toward Issei. With a mouth full of food, the Mao then pointed at an empty seat that was next to her. Good morning Ishai, Pleesh, over here. Before Issei could react, Kuno stood from her seat and waved both of her little arms out. No, don't sit next to Auntie, sit next to me and Mommy. Smiling nervously, Issei turned back and forth from Seraphal to Kuno, then a blushing Yusaka and then back at Sona. Oh boy. Meanwhile Sona gains a tick mark as she takes hold of Issei's shirt and drags him to a pair of chairs near the end of the large table. Kuno grinds her teeth at this. Seraphal rolls her eyes and continues to eat. Yusaka pulls Kuno back into her seat. Sitting down nervously, Issei looked around the table and looked back at Kuno. So, breakfast was a hit, EHH. Kiddo, nodding, the little fox princess takes another bite of her pancake. Yes, thank you for getting up so early, just to spend time with me, Papa Kuno. Kuno ends her sentence as her eyes are directed toward Sona. She then covertly sticks her tongue out at the flustered sea tree heiress. Sona looks at both Issei and then Kuno. Slowly, her eyebrow twitched ever so slightly. Then, Sona faked a plastic smile. Well, little girl, that's really nice. Feeling the tension between the two, Issei clears his throat. Ahem, well, I was wondering, if we had some time today, I kind of wanted to test out my gear. I mean, Dedrag told me that I have a magic reserve now so I wanna see what I can do. Instantly, Sona became very serious as she began to adjust her glasses. Seraphal also seemed to focus a bit more as the two had their direct attention on the team. Yusaka takes a sip of her coffee while quietly nodding. Saji, who was sitting in between Momo and Ruruko, raised his arm into the air. Ya know, I wouldn't mind stretching out a bit. Don't get me wrong, 
This whole vacation has been really nice and cushy, but a little bit of training couldn't hurt. Besides, after that thing that happened with the ice maiden and the dog chick, well, Saji then looks directly at Issei. I didn't know you could do that. I wanna get stronger with my gear, like you did. Momo and Ruruko both nod in agreement. Issei can see the determination in his friend and nodded as well. Yusaka then giggles into her sleeve. Foo 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 foo. Well, if you are wanting some physical activities, might I suggest the ground's private dojo? Yusaka then looks back at Issei and winks. Blushing, Issei nods. Yeah, erm, physical activities, hee hee. The teen now rubs the back of his head while smiling nervously. Sona sees the exchanges in looks between Yusaka and Issei, this makes her jealousy puff her cheeks out. From under the table, Sona proceeded to reach over and pinch the teen on his thigh. Jumping from his seat, the teen yelled in pain. As everyone looked toward a screaming Issei, Sona slowly showed a slight grin. Scene, Yusaka Dojo. After breakfast was done and over with, Sona ordered her peerage to clean up and meet toward the mentioned dojo. After a bit of time went by, Sona, Tsubaki, Issei and Serifal were the first to arrive. The building was an old-fashioned wooden structure. It was decorated with wooden carvings of different demi-humans, all holding and posing with different martial arts weaponry. Before Issei had a chance to admire this dojo a bit more, Serifal clears her throat. Ahem, so, Issei-kun, are you going to try and use your overbooster? Serifal begins to make a naughty sign while waving her index finger into the air. Serifal was also showing a strangely worried looking smile. Issei shakes his head, no, after all, you told me not to, Milky. Sona's eyebrow twitched at Issei's pet name for her sister. Tsubaki remained silent however she was paying attention to the situation with great interest. Serifal nodded as her smile lost its worrisome traits. Issei then raises his arm into the air while looking at his open hand. Smiling brightly, Issei looks at each of the girls. Dedrag says I have a magic pool now. See, the reason why I couldn't use a balance breaker, naturally I mean, is because I'm weak. Issei shows a slight frown, however that changes back into a smile very quickly. But, since Yusaka, well, she kind of fixed me, you know. That last bit was hard for Issei to say out loud as he was trying to hold back a tear. Serifal was able to notice this hint of regret coming from her boyfriend. As her smile now turned into a very serious frown, the Mao approached the teen while proceeding to grab hold of his collar. Feeling pressure around his neck, Issei found himself face to face with a very pissed off looking Serifal as she gripped ever so tightly. Sona and Tsubaki both had looks of absolute shock. You are not weak. Don't ever speak lowly of yourself again. I order you, as your, Serifal seems to choke on her words as she sounds like she wants to cry. I order you as your Mao, Erm Milky. Releasing her grip, Serifal falls onto the ground while landing on her behind. Right afterwards, the Mao began to cry like a child as both of her hands were holding her face. Sona and Tsubaki have a serious case of discombobulation as Issei shows a very concerned expression. Crouching down, Issei places both of his arms on the Mao's crying shoulders. She then removes her hands from her wet face and looks up at Issei's warm and smiling face with her large and watery blue eyes. I'm sorry, Milky, please don't get too upset with me. But, the reason I wanted all of you here was to prove that I am no longer weak. I wanted to reveal that I think I can do a natural balance breaker. Not to mention, something else, I have a power called, transfer. I know you guys only saw 10 seconds, 10 seconds that cost me, but still, just 10 seconds. I just figured, since we might end up fighting together in the future, it would be smart to know everyone's abilities for strategic purposes. Serifal tilts her head, as does Sona and Tsubaki. Oh, well, why didn't you say so earlier, Issei-kun? Serifal now has her bright smile returned to her. Now offering both of his hands to Serifal, she accepts them and is helped to her feet. Issei then laughs nervously, and you're right, I am not weak, well, not anymore and I don't just mean what Yusaka did for me. Looking now at Sona as well, Issei continued while blushing. If it wasn't for you guys, I really don't know where I'd be. Sona returns the blush as Serifal shows a very intense and emotional smile. Tsubaki noticed a sudden change in temperature as she began to feel very warm. 
Blushing slightly, the queen pushed her feelings aside and focused at the task at hand. Instantly, Tsubaki's attention was now directed toward the oncoming peerage members. Tomo, Rea, Momo, Tsubasa, Veruko and Saji are all wearing sweats and workout clothes. As the six arrive, Tsubaki is looking at her wrist watch. Lifting an eyebrow, Tsubaki looks back at each of the members. You are all late, perhaps you are all getting too comfortable in this vacation setting. Issei laughs, oh come on now, Vice President, this was just a last minute thing I suggested, so, it's not a big deal, after all, it's my fault no matter how you look at it. Tsubaki then slowly turns her head toward Issei while adjusting her glasses. Hiyodo, I did not ask for your opinion. Sona looks back and forth at Tsubaki and Issei, then face palms. Enough, both of you, everyone, get inside and form a large circle on the floor. Saji and Issei will participate in a mock battle. Now, move it. Moments later, Issei found himself standing in the center of this large dojo. He was standing on a slightly padded mat while staring back at a smirking Saji. Meanwhile, all of the girls were sitting down on mats while they sat in a circle around Saji and Issei. Saji then raises his arm into the air. Come to me, Vitra. Saji was now covered in black and purple light. Once the flash had ended, Saji's arm now had a black gauntlet. It looked similar to Issei's first stage gauntlet, except this one was black and had what appeared to be two purple gems in front which looked almost like eyes. Nodding, Issei took one step back and called for his sacred gear. Boosted gear. After another flash, red with green colors this time, Issei now had his signature and clawed gauntlet in all of its crimson glory. Saji took a good look, and smirked. Both teams squared up and prepared for their match. Boost, boost. Issei shouts before rushing toward his rival with all of his might. Saji aims his wrist toward Issei and shouts. Absorption line. At those words, a blue and glowing wave of energy shot from the sacred gear. It didn't look to be a blast as it instantly wrapped itself around Issei's leg. Tripping, Issei rolled onto the floor while gritting his teeth. Sona facepalmed at this. Rushing in like that is no strategy, Issei. To Issei, he suddenly began to lose his strength. Now standing up, the team studied the glowing rope like appendage wrapped around his leg. Dedrag, what is this Vitra thing and what the hell is that? Ah yes, Vitra, one of the five dragon kings. This one went evil and was banished into multiple sacred gears. To be perfectly honest with you, the guy was a jerk. Yes, yes, fascinating Dedrag, totally but what am I supposed to do about this stupid whip thing? Oh, right, that is an absorb line. Once attached, it drains the strength of its victim. Well, it works just like a normal rope, right? Like the physics are practically the same, right? Aside from the line being severed by normal means, yeah, pretty much, it works like a rope. Thanks his partner. Issei now grins. Boost, boost. Saji now feels a slight tugging to his absorb line. As his smirk turned into a look of worry, the sea tree devil found himself airborne as Issei tugged his side of the line. Instantly, all of the girls watching made cringes as Saji's face met with Issei's extended foot. Sona immediately retracts her internal thoughts regarding Issei's tactics. Looking now at Saji, who was now on his butt while rubbing his swollen face, the sea tree heiress stands up. Well, that was very interesting. So when you boost, you gain physical strength. Sona adjusts her glasses while staring at a mildly panting Issei. Rubbing the back of his head, Issei smiles nervously. Kind of. Every time I boost, I gain twice the strength of my previous boost. So, with two boosts, I have four times the strength. But, that's not all. Issei slowly approaches Sona after helping Saji to his feet. Sona tilts her head in surprise as Issei places his gauntlet on her shoulder. Issei then winks. Get ready. From what I've seen, it's a bit of a shock, at least from the reactions of my peerage members. Transfer. Issei yells this as Dedrag responds to his order. Transfer. As her eyes threaten to roll back from the intense pressure she was feeling, Sona forces herself to endure this overwhelming feeling of intense power absorbing into her. It felt so warm, almost like a heated blanket, covering the heiress's entire body. But it wasn't just that. No, Sona also felt something much deeper. What was this? 
Why did she feel like she could destroy this entire dojo in one blast without breaking a sweat? Issei then falls to one knee as Dedrag announced in a loud growl. Reset. Seeing this, Sona crouches down while steadying her boyfriend as his eyes begin to close while he maintains his bright smile. Seraphal stands as well as Subaki. They both rush toward the crouching couple with looks of concern. Issei Kun. Seraphal slid on her knees while taking hold of Issei's arm. Her large and blue eyes were jetting out tears. Issei's bare arm now began to glow with hints of crimson and emerald. Calm yourself, Mao Seraphal Leviathan, all is well. Sona and Subaki look toward Issei's arm as the two each lift an eyebrow. Meanwhile Seraphal rubs her snotty nose while reaching for a tissue. The boosted gear has its advantages and disadvantages. Whenever Issei must, reset, this is because I am cutting his power off before it begins to damage his body. Therefore, the stronger he gets, the longer he can use his abilities. Also, Sona Citri, I suggest you leave this room and release what my partner has given you before it becomes a problem. The glow from Issei's arm started to diminish. Sona thought about what she had just heard when she noticed a slight headache beginning to worsen moment by moment. Realizing that she should heed the dragon's words, Sona then pushed her side of Issei onto Subaki, making the vice president blush heavily while standing up and making a beeline toward the exit. The moment Sona was outside, she extended both of her arms as a mixture of water and ice magic began to shoot into the sky. This continued long enough for Seraphal, who had Issei in a both of her arms as if he were a baby and the peerage to leave the dojo and stand around a flustered looking Sona. As Sona continued to point her hands toward the sky, she looked around her nervously. Seraphal, this is fucking ridiculous. How much longer is this going to? Sona's terrified look turned into something much more calm as the explosion of magic had finally ceased. Finally feeling as though she would put her arms down, Sona turned toward Seraphal who was smiling brightly. Seraphal then readjusted the sleeping teen in her arms while winking toward her little sister. Wow, so tan. You know what they say, better out than in, right? Well that's all for now see you in the next part.